morning, everyone. I'm Phil, and welcome to the Oceanside Sanctuary. And as you know, many of you know, one of the first things we do when we open our service, we sing praises to God, and then we open with the Lord's Prayer. And we're studying right now the book of Matthew, and uh, Matthew, whenever it was written, and whoever the person was, to him, the Lord's Prayer is the most important thing there is. It is right in the middle of his teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. So, let's begin, and let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. And you may pray any way you want, you may pray any way that you feel most connected to God. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the service. Well, good morning again, Oceanside Sanctuary. It's good to be back with you here on YouTube and Facebook for our online Sunday morning gathering. Today I'm excited because we are nearing the end of our teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount. Today is our second to last teaching. We are approaching the last passages, the last stories, the last images that Jesus gave in this, his central sermon in his entire ministry. If you've been with us up to this point, you know that we have been looking at Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7. And today we are going to jump into, again, like I said, the second to last section on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm excited to share with you what I'm noticing and how I think God is stirring up my imagination to see Jesus' teachings in a fresh way. And I hope that God is stirring your imagination too. Before we jump into the text, as always, I want to invite you to join with me just in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds to take this text and really allow it to penetrate our hearts. Would you just pray with me? God, we thank you again for today, for this opportunity for us to come together, to gather online, to worship together, wherever we might be, whether we're at home, uh, on the front porch or the back porch or in our vehicle somewhere waiting, or if we are at work or wherever we might be, we are amazed that we can come together in this way and join our hearts and our minds with you and be transformed and changed by you. We ask that you would do that work in us collectively as a church in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount series and we are almost done. I've said over and over again that this really is the central teaching in Jesus's ministry. And of course, because we are followers of Jesus, that means that really more than almost anything else in Scripture, that this is really the, the section of Scripture, the passage of Scripture that we must give ourselves to understanding. If there are portions of the Bible that are more central to followers of Jesus, then that's probably in the New Testament that tell the story, not only of Jesus, but then how the gospel went out into the world, and then the letters that the apostles wrote to the early church. All of that is sort of central to us as Christians, as followers of Christ. And within that New Testament, I've said that certainly the most important books for us to understand are the Gospels, those four stories, those four versions or tellings of the life and the teachings of Jesus, who is the person that we are following. And within those four books, those four Gospels, I've said certainly there is an even more important part, a central part of the Gospels, and that is the teaching that Jesus gave over and over again wherever he went in his ministry. Scholars widely agree that this teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, is really the center of Jesus' teaching. And so when we think about Jesus, first and foremost, we ought to be thinking about how he taught us to live. 
more so than anything else in his ministry. And that is contained in these three chapters in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapters 5 and 6 and 7. And so we've been going over that for the last several weeks. And just to recap, I've said that you can view this Sermon on the Mount, this teaching of Jesus, in a couple of different sort of chapters or sections. And the first thing we saw was the Beatitudes, this opening session of Jesus' teaching where he invites really anybody and everybody to come along and become people who are integrated into the kingdom of God or the power of God. And the Beatitudes, I said, of course, basically make it clear that the people who are central to the kingdom are the people who have been pushed to the margins in the world. And he calls those people salt and light. He says that they will be the people who make the difference in the world in this sort of great irony of the kingdom of God. And that's sort of the prelude to the Sermon on the Mount. And from there, I said, Jesus jumps in to his teachings with a kind of diagnosis of the human heart. And there in the second half of Matthew chapter five, I pointed out that Jesus gives us a kind of diagnosis for all of the things that ail humanity, the violence, the greed, the sexual violence, the ways in which we are hostile and, and competing with each other and, and harming each other and hoarding resources, all the things that tend to lead to the worst expressions of humanity. Jesus talks about all those things in the second half of Matthew chapter 5. And when he talks about it, he makes it clear that the problem is central to our hearts. That deep within our hearts, we have desires that we don't know what to do with, that we can't control. And he makes it clear that unless we can figure out how to get control of those deep, destructive desires in our hearts, that we can't be changed or transformed. And then from there, I said that the next sort of chapter of the Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus talks about the deep work of spirituality. And he does this by visiting the three most common spiritual practices of Judaism, that is giving and prayer and fasting. And we talked all about how those practices, when done rightly, begin to transform our hearts, to change us to make us people who do have control over those destructive desires. And then a couple weeks ago, I said that in the next portion of the Sermon on the Mount, the second half of chapter six, Matthew chapter six, Jesus turns another corner. And the next chapter is really about how those who have done the deep work of spiritual practices, that they begin to exhibit a transformed life. And that is where we are now, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about Jesus' description of a transformed life for those who have learned how to press into the deep work of spiritual practices that can connect us to a sense of the presence of God and begin to change us. Now, we really got into this last week in a bit more detail with Travis's message about judging. And I want to pick up where he left off and then hopefully situate Travis's teachings within a sort of bigger perspective of what's happening here in Matthew chapter 7. So jump into Matthew chapter 7 with me. I'm going to pick this up in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And these are our central passages for today. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good, good gifts to those who ask of him? And so here we have what seems to be Jesus revisiting a kind of teaching on prayer. If you remember, of course, Jesus already taught on prayer in Matthew chapter 6, where 
He talked about the central practices of his faith, the central spiritual practices of Judaism. And he gave us, of course, a kind of pattern for prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus seems to be revisiting the whole notion of prayer. And he says something that I think, frankly, can be a little bit difficult to swallow, a little difficult to take. He says in verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Jesus seems to say here that whatever we ask of God in prayer, we will get. And this, of course, is something that Christians have latched onto for two millennia. They have taken Jesus' words that, say, that seem to say that whatever we ask for, God will give us. And then they put that to practice and they really believe that they can essentially appeal to God for anything that they want, anything that they need, and expect that God will give it to them because Jesus said so. The problem with that, of course, is if you're anything like me, you have put that to the test. And you know as well as I do that prayer doesn't work that way. Very often the things we pray for, in fact, very often, the things that we pray for that we want the most are the very things that we don't seem to get. Prayer turns out to be something that we, we fumble around with, we engage in it earnestly and passionately, and when the stakes are at their highest, oftentimes it seems like God is quietest in God's response to us. And that can produce a great deal of frustration and disillusionment and even a loss of faith. And so one of the ways that we respond to that is we assume that we must be doing prayer wrong. We think, well, Jesus said we'll have whatever we want if we just pray for it, if we just ask for it. So perhaps we're asking from the wrong motives or perhaps we're using the wrong method in prayer. I've been a part of all different kinds of traditions of Christianity, and there are traditions of Christianity that are built entirely on the idea that if you just approach God in the right way, then you'll get whatever it is that you ask for. You'll get whatever it is that you want. And in those traditions, a great deal of time and energy and money and effort is poured into teaching people the right way and the wrong way to think about God, to talk about God, to ask God for things in their lives. Entire books and a whole cottage industry of spiritual literature has been built on the idea that if you just approach God in the right way, then finally you will get the things that you ask for. It's amazing to me. All the different ways that we will contort ourselves and twist ourselves so that we can somehow, by some means, coerce God into finally giving us whatever it is that we ask for. And still, that's not what happens. And so I think any honest, thoughtful Christian reads these words where Jesus seems to say, whatever it is you want, ask for it and God will give it to you. Any genuinely, intellectually honest Christian will read these words and say, it doesn't seem to work that way, God. I don't understand what is it that I'm doing wrong here or were you wrong, Jesus, when you said that if I just ask for anything that I'll receive. Well, I think what would be helpful is if we sort of zoomed out on this passage and took a look at what is happening here in a little bit larger context. And the first clue to that bigger context is the sermon that Travis brought us last week. Travis began in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, where Jesus is talking about judgment. And there, Jesus has turned a little bit of a page. If you remember from the week before, two weeks ago, I talked about how this first, or excuse me, this second half of Matthew chapter 6 really seems to be all about Jesus teaching about freedom from worry, freedom from anxiety, freedom from the need to be in control. And he turns from that topic to this subject of judging. Travis brought us an excellent teaching last week on judging and the pitfalls of judging and how Jesus frees us and delivers us from the need to judge other human beings because that is not our job. But look at this. Right after judging, 
Jesus says something else about other people. He says, do not give what's holy to dogs and don't throw pearls before swine or they'll trample you and turn and maul you. And so first, Jesus gives us a teaching about not judging other people. And then he gives us a teaching about not offering to people the things that they don't want from us, even if we think they're good. And he gives us a teaching about not trying to force upon others the things that we think they really need. And then Jesus turns to our passage today about asking and seeking and knocking. And then after that, if you'll notice in verse 12, Jesus moves to maybe his most famous passage of all, the golden rule. He says, in everything that you do, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the summary. This is the, the, the entirety of the law and the prophets. I want you to see what I want to suggest to you, what I want to propose to you, is that this whole section is really about being liberated from our tendency to be hostile to each other. This whole section is about our tendency to want to judge and control and manipulate other people. This whole section from verse 1 all the way through to verse 12 is how those who have done the deep work of inner transformation will have an entirely different posture towards other people. We'll no longer judge each other. We'll no longer try to force good things on other people because we think that's what you need. We will finally treat each other the way that we want to be treated. This whole section is, I think, Jesus teaching us that we can finally, once and for all, be free, utterly liberated from the relationships of hostility and coercion and control that we so often have with each other. And in the middle of this section, right in the middle of this section on how to be free from hostility from each other, Jesus drops a teaching that seems to be about prayer. But Jesus, I think, isn't exclusively teaching us about prayer. Jesus is saying, not just if we ask for something, we will get it, as though he's giving us some kind of magic formula for forcing God's hand. No, I think Jesus is saying, if you want something, just ask. If you want something, just ask. Instead of doing what we always do, which is seeing something that we want, desiring it in our hearts, obsessing over it in our minds, and then obsessing over the various ways that we can approach God to get what we want, and then contorting our lives, our spiritual practices, our prayers, our piety, our worship, our sacrifices, whatever it might be, arranging our whole lives in such a way as to somehow coerce or manipulate God so that God will give us what I, we want. Jesus says in response to that, stop doing that. If you want something, just ask. And then he goes on to give us the essential reason why we can do that. The essential reason why we can just ask for what we want is, of course, because God is good. Jesus turns to this passage again and he says, listen, who of you, if your child asked for bread, would you give them a rock? Who of you, if your child asked for something to eat, you would give them a snake? Listen, if you know how to be good to your own children, how much better will God be to you? Jesus is rooting our sense of confidence and security in just asking for what we want in this bigger picture, this bigger idea that God is good that the ultimate power in the universe, that the universe itself, that life and all that we consider to be good and right and true and holy, that that is good and we can trust it, we can count on it. And because it's good, Jesus says, 
Quit trying to control and manipulate God and just ask for what you want. And of course, this little lesson on prayer that Jesus drops in the middle of this section isn't just about prayer. Because it turns out that whatever our disposition is towards God, whatever our disposition is towards the universe, whatever our posture is towards the world, that is also our posture towards other people. Jesus isn't just saying that if we want something from God, just ask. He's also saying when you want something from each other, just ask. You and I can be free from a kind of life that is so filled with insecurity and mistrust and hostility that we think we have to twist ourselves into knots in order to control and manipulate and coerce God and each other to get the things that we need in life. Instead, Jesus says that those who have done the deep spiritual work those who have had their inner lives transformed will be those who know that God and life and the world are good and that the right way to ask for what we want is to just ask for it. That is a life that is truly liberated from hostility. It's only possible if you have done that deep spiritual work, it's only possible if you have embraced the notion that God is so good that God has included all people and centered those who were previously on the margins. It's only possible if you have been liberated from a life of worry and anxiety because you know that you can trust that God wants what is good for you and is providing you abundantly for all that you need. All of this is Jesus' way of teaching us that the process of learning to love God and be with God is a process that produces good things in our lives. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you again for today and for this opportunity to come and to be challenged by these words, to read these passages of Scripture together, to have our hearts opened and our minds opened to have our lives transformed by your goodness and your grace. We ask that you would make all that true in our lives today and tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Oceanside Sanctuary. Sometimes the only way to describe the divine is to use the word indescribable. To the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall To the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light? Seals it to bring us the coolness of a night. None can fathom. Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the
the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god oh yeah all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing god Unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. Hey, good morning, Oceanside Sanctuary. Now we are going to do communion. So go ahead and grab your elements, whatever you might have today, and let's get started. So I've been thinking a lot about communion this week and the past week. And, you know, we just got done celebrating Day of the Dead and thinking about the ways that we remember our past and our ancestors. And I realized that in many ways, that's what communion is about. In fact, if we think of Jesus being with his disciples for the last time before he was betrayed, he said one simple phrase, remember me. So I think as we take communion today, I encourage you to simply remember Christ. Remember the people, your ancestors, the ones who've come before you, who are also part of this lineage, this tradition, the saints, you know, who are watching over us as we do this thing called life. So as you take communion today, Keep that theme in mind of remembrance and think about how you can remember Christ in your daily walk in these weeks and months to come. So on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it and gave thanks and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, remember me. On that same night, he took the cup of wine and he said, take, drink, this is my blood poured out for you. Whenever you drink this, remember me. So happy communion. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service and God bless. Hey guys, welcome back to the Oceanside Sanctuary. It's Kaya. I know it's been a while since you've seen me. So hey, what's up? How are you guys? Um, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you had a good Halloween. If you celebrated, we got Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas, Christmas is my favorite. I love Christmas, but like Thanksgiving, pumpkin pie is really good. Um, so enough about the holidays and tangents. Um, before you guys head off, I have a couple quick announcements for you guys. So the first one is if you are new, hi, hello, welcome. We are so excited to have you here this morning. Um, we would love to get to know you, get to know how you um, found our church, how you became a member um if you want to become a member so if you would love to um also get to know a little bit about us we would love if you guys would fill out the uh connect card um you can simply scan the qr code um if you are in person or if you are online you can simply visit our website um and we would love to get to know you we have a community meeting um, with chief fred armijo i really hope i pronounced that correctly I I don't know, I think so. But that's gonna be Tuesday, November 9th, um, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, this is actually going to be in person. Um, it also can be online, so it's also gonna be on Zoom. So you can RSVP to be in person or you can RSVP to go do join Zoom. Uh, so we would love to see you there if you would like to attend. Just make sure to RSVP and uh by doing that you can visit our website i'm pretty sure or visit uh bit.ly slash um o side police meeting 
we have the 146th anniversary coming up for our church. Woohoo! Um, that's gonna be Sunday, November 14th at 11 a.m. Uh, this is going to be basically just a regular service, regular time, so you can either come on Zoom or in person, however you feel. And it's just gonna be a special um, service. Uh, we're gonna have a birthday cake. Um, as we honor our past, present, and future legacy of Oceanside Sanctuary. On November 18th from, sorry, on November 18th at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom, we have our call and response club. Woo! Um, so if you want to go to that, make sure that you RSVP at OceansideSanctuary.org slash calendar to get the Zoom link that is going to be um, on Zoom, not in person, um, November 18th at 6.30 and finally, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, and we rely on the gifts and donations of you guys. So, like I say every time, the QR code is your friend. That sounds like a dystopian movie, but hey, it is what it is. It is what it is. So, um, simply, if you would like to give to us, simply scan the QR code. If you are in person, um, visit OceansideSanctuary.org/give. Or you can donate if you in the box in the back, um, also if you're in person. Uh, so that's going to be it for the couple quick announcements that I have.